Hello everyone! In this video, we will create a simple slot machine game for Android platform. In this game, we can pull a handle and after a few seconds get our price if the slots read some matches. You can get all of the art assets by the link in the description and make such game following this video. Let's get started. Here is our new empty project, which is switched to Android platform. Aspect ratio is set to 9 by 16, so portrait orientation is supposed to be used. Ok. Here, into Art folder, I dragged and drop ping files that you can get by the link in the description. Let's begin from result sprite and drag and drop it into the scene. It's quite too big, so let's scale it down holding Shift key. It will help us to scale it proportionally. There we go. I modify its position a bit, so it will be about at the middle top. Now let's add a slot machine sprite into the scene. It's too big as well. Also, let's add the rest of the sprites that will be used in our game. All of them should be scaled down. We will scale them down evenly using one useful tool to scale game objects. So all of our game objects are added. Now let's select the sprites responsible for displaying our game objects. They are handle, row, slot, slot gradient and slot machine sprites. Now with these sprites selected, I change their pixel per unit option to greater value from 100 to 200. The higher this value is, the smaller game object appears. Hit apply to apply the change. There we go. Game objects become smaller evenly. Let's delete them for now. And if we add a slot machine sprite and others, they will have appropriate size. So slot machine is in the scene. Let's position it about here. Next game object will be a handle which will be pulled to start the slot machine. It's supposed to be rotated around its lower end, but as we can see, game object's pivot point is located in the middle of the handle. So if we rotate it, it is rotated around this point, but we want to rotate it around the lower point. To make it happen, select handle sprite and go to sprite editor. Here we can move this pivot point wherever we want to. Just drag and drop it right about here. Hit apply to save the change and close sprite editor. Now the handle is rotated around its lower end. Let's position the handle where it's supposed to be. And let's set handle's order in layer option to 2, so it will be rendered in front of the slot machine, which has this value set to 0. Now let's add slots. Inside these slots, our price items will be kind of rotating. Drag and drop one slot sprite and position it right about here. Order on layer will be set to 2, so slot will be above the slot machine. Rename it as slot 1. This slot is supposed to be a kind of hole through which we will see what is happening inside the slot machine. To simulate this function, let's add a sprite mask component to this game object. Type in sprite into search field. Here it is what we need. Sprite mask. Here we need to set kind of shape of our mask. It will be the same with our slot shape itself. So drag and drop slot sprite into sprite field here. Ok. We will see how it works just in a moment. Before that, let's add a slot gradient sprite into the scene and make it to be a child of the slot game object. Set its x and y coordinates to 0, so it has the same position with the parent game object. I forgot to do it for some reason. Ok. Slot 1 has order and layer set to 2. Slot gradient should be above it, so let's set order and layer for this game object to 3. Now we have this slot looks like cylinder, or I hope it looks like that at least. Anyway, let's duplicate this slot twice by pressing Ctrl plus D keys and rename these two new game objects as slot 2 and slot 3. There we go. Position these new slots so we have three slots to show the results of our game. There we go. Now it's time to add items that will be spinning inside these slots. Take row sprite and drag and drop it into the scene. Here it is. Let's rename it as row 1. It's rendered behind our slots, so let's set its order in layer to 3 and it will be rendered in front of the slot and behind the slot gradient. Now it's time to use that sprite mask component that we added to slot game object. Our row is always visible, no matter where it's positioned. Let's make it to be visible only through our slots hole. Select row game object and set mask interaction option to visible inside the mask. Now, as we can see, it is visible only inside the slot. Great. Duplicate this row game object twice 
pressing Ctrl plus D keys. Rename these new rows as row 1 and row 3 and position them inside slot 2 and slot 3 correspondingly. Let's check out if they are aligned well. Ok, looks fine. Now let's create UI text element that will show us the results of our game. First, let's create new UI canvas and set its scale mode to scale with screen size. Then right click on canvas and create new UI text. I rename this new text game object as price text. Double click it to focus on it. Here it is in the middle of the canvas. We are going to modify its text field through the script, but let's just make it clear what is this text game object for and type price here. Change color to white. Let's change font family to one of my favorite one, dragging and dropping chunk 5 font into font slot. Make font size bigger. Align it at the center. Let's set horizontal overflow to overflow, so our text will not disappear if it goes out of the boundaries of its rect. Make rect bigger and position it right about here. Let me show you why we set the overflow to overflow. For example, if we win a thousand, so price text will show us something like that. As we can see, price sign goes out of the boundaries here. If overflow is set to wrap, then the whole text will not be shown. But if we set it to overflow, then everything will be fine. Price text is done. Let's focus back on our slot machine. Ok, we need one more game object that will control our game. Let's create new empty and name it as game control. Here it is quite empty. Let's position it about at the top of the handle and let's add a box collider to it, so this game object will detect our finger touch or mouse click on the handle. Let it be a trigger and let's edit it a bit like so. Ok, now this area will detect if we touch or click it. Now it's time to pay attention to the scripts that will actually control the whole game. Let's begin with game control script. Here it is. First of all, we need to say that this script uses system library for the reason that we are going to use an event of action type. Without going very deep into it, let's say that in this line of code we declare an event which is named handle pulled. This event will be triggered by game control script when the handle will be pulled basically. So, when it happens, the game control script kind of says to other scripts Hey, everybody, the handle is pulled, are you going to do something with that? And fortunately, the row script that will be attached to each row game object is going to respond to that event. But to be able to hear what game object script is saying during that event, the row script should be subscribed to that event. Let's take a quick look at row script. Here in start method, we subscribe start rotating method of row script. So, when handle pulled event occurs, then start rotating method will be invoked. We will examine row script closer in a few minutes. This is basically how events work. But it is a quite simple example though. Ok, let's move on with game control script. Next, here we have price text variable that can be assigned in inspector that will be used to control price text game object. Next, here we have rows array that will help us to get information about our rows. Next one is handle variable that will help us to rotate a handle game object when it's pulled. Serialize field attributes help us to assign those variables in inspector. Price value variable will hold the price value that we want. And results checked variable will not to allow check the results multiple times when rows stop spinning. Ok, let's see what's going on in update method. There is a public boolean variable in row script named row stopped that takes true value when a particular row stops spinning. So, if even one of the row is still spinning, then price value is set to zero, price text game object is turned off and results checked is set to false. So, we are waiting until all of the rows stop spinning. Then, if all of the rows stopped and results aren't checked yet, then check results method is invoked, price text object is turned on and its text field is modified so it shows us a price value that we win. On mouse down method is invoked when left mouse button is clicked over some collider. This method works pretty well with finger touch as well. You can use it if you need just to detect one single touch. But if you are creating some complicated game for mobile platform with a lot of touch events such as multiple touch, drag and drop and so on, then you definitely should use mobile touch event function instead of that. But as I said, in our case, on mouse down method will work pretty fine. And also, it allows us to test our game in the editor. So, when on mouse down method is invoked, 
Then we check if all of the rows stopped and if they did, then pull handle coroutine is started. This coroutine rotates the handle by 15 degrees towards us and 15 degrees from us, creating an effect that handle is being pulled. So this coroutine consists of two parts. In the first part, the handle game object is rotated three times by 5 degrees towards us, where each rotation is paused by 0.1 second. In the second part, the handle is rotated back from us three times by 5 degrees. Between these two parts, when the handle is in the middle of its journey, game object script triggers handle pulled event. So here is how handle pulled event is announced. Row script hear this announcement and invokes start rotating method. OK. I hope it's clear. Then here is check results method goes. There is public stopped slot variable in row script. That variable has string type and it takes different values depending on position that row game object has when it stops. I promise we will examine row script in a few moments. So if all of the rows stop and show us diamonds, then price value is set to 200. If all of them show crown, then price value is set to 400. And so on with melon, bar, 7, cherry and lemon. The next blocks of code check pairs. So if first row equals to second and they both show diamond, or if first row equals to third and they show diamond, or finally if second row equals to third and they show diamond, then price value is set to 100. Same checking is performed for crown, melon, bar, 7, cherry and lemon. My poor brain couldn't put all of these checkings into some loop. All I could come up with is this awful else if set. So if you have any idea how to sort all of this out with better efficiency, please put it into comment section. Community and I will be very appreciated for that. Ok, in the end, here we set results checked to true, so results will not be checked every frame if they are checked already. That's the game control script. Now it's time to keep a promise and take a closer look to row script. Here it is. First, here we have random value variable that will hold number of rotation steps for spinning row. In other words, how long the particular row will be spinning until it stops. Time interval variable will be used to slow the movement of the row down during the spinning. Row stopped variable will be set to true when the particular row stops spinning. Stopped slot variable will hold the name of item which is shown by particular slot when row stops. In start method we set row stop to true since it's not moving yet. And subscribe to handle pulled event to be ready to invoke start rotating method when handle is pulled. This start rotating method is pretty simple. First we reset row stopped variable value and then start coroutine named rotate which actually moves a row. Let's see what is happening inside this coroutine. First we set row stop to false which means that the row is spinning now. Then we set time interval to 0.025 second. This time interval represents a time between shifts of row position when it's spinning. Then we have a loop which help us to spin the row with constant speed initially. This loop has 30 iterations. Each iteration the position of the row is shifted downwards by 0.25 units. Let's see how it works selecting row 1 for example. Let's set y coordinate to some precise value. So, to simulate row spinning, we will shift its position, modifying its y coordinate by 0.25 units. So, initially it equals to 2. Add 0.25 and it's shifted downwards. Add another one 0.25 and it's shifted again. And so on. Each position differs from another by 0.25 units. Last position of each row, which equals to negative 3.5, should be noticed. At this point, the spinning will be looped. So, if y coordinate equals to negative 3.5, then it's set to 1.75. At this position, our row sprite shows a diamond as well. So, when a row reaches the upper diamond, then it is immediately shifted to lower diamond. This trick creates an illusion that we have kind of cylinder with images that rotates inside the slot machine. Pretty cool. Ok, each iteration is paused by time interval value. After that initial spinning with constant speed, we need to slow the spinning down to complete stopping. For that reason, we calculate random value from a range between 60 and 100. So each row will have its own spinning cycle. When random value is calculated, we need to correct it a bit if it's needed. Let me show you what I mean. We need number of steps or shifts to be multiple of 3, because we have 3 steps between each item in a row. So by getting a reminder of division of random value by 3, 
we can get a clue how to correct this random value. So, if reminder equals to 1, that it means that the row will stop not in the correct position. In this position, actually. So, to put the row into correct position, we need to make two more steps. 1 2 So, for that reason, we add two more steps to our random value. And if reminder equals to 2, then it means that the row will stop in that position and it needs to take one more step to be in the correct position. So we add one more step to the random value. Like that. Ok, random value is corrected. After that we have another loop, where the row is spinning with number of steps equals to random value, just like with initial rotation. The difference is here, where we slow down the spinning, depending on how many steps the row passed. So, if number of iterations passes a quarter of random value, then time interval between iterations becomes twice longer. If number of iterations passes a half of a random value, then time interval is increased to 0.1 second. And so on. This trick allows us to create an effect of slowing down of the spinning. When row stops, we need to check the final position of the row. So, if y position equals to negative 3.5, then the slot shows diamond. Let's see, set negative 3.5. Yes, it's a diamond. Stopped slot variable becomes equal to diamond. If y position is negative 2.75, then slot shows a crown. There we go. And so on. Negative 2 is a melon. Negative 1.25 is a bar. Negative 0.5 is a 7. 0.25 is a cherry, 1 is a lemon, and 1.75 is a diamond as well. At the end of the coroutine, we set row stop to true. Final important thing here in row script. If some script, the row script in our case, is subscribed to some global event to respond to it, then it should be unsubscribed from it later. In our case, we do it in onDestroy method. If we forget to unsubscribe from any event, then we can get a missing reference exception in some cases, if that game object was destroyed or a scene was reloaded. So, to avoid that, we should unsubscribe from any global event. Ok, that's the script. Drag and drop row script to row 1, row 2 and row 3 game objects. And drag and drop game control script to game control game object. Select game control and let's tune this game control component. Drag and drop price text game object into price text slot. Set rows array size to 3 and drag and drop row 1, row 2 and row 3 game objects into corresponding slots. And finally, drag and drop handle game object into handle slot. Ok, almost done. Finally, let's set y position of our row game objects to be equal to some final position. Row 1 is crown negative 2.75, ok. Row 2 will be a melon, negative 2. And row 3 will be a melon as well, negative 2. Ok, everything is done. Now we can hit play and see how it works in the editor. Works fine. Also we can create an apk file and see how it works on Android device. This is how it works on mine. Ok, this is it. Hope this tutorial was useful for you. Thank you for watching. See you next time.